Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Living Islam in America. I'm your host, Johari Abdul Malik. And today's show is entirely dedicated to the hijabi monologues, the phenomenal women's play that is taking America by stealth in underground thespian circles to standing room only audiences. All that and more after these messages. Ask anyone who's seen the play Hijabi Monologues what it's about, and they'll be quick to say that it's not just about the head covering called hijab. And if the name sounds familiar, because its title is a play on words from Eve Ensler's theatrical, The Regina Monologues, with a, a key difference being that the latter takes a private issue and makes it public, and HM, Hijabi Monologues, takes a highly public and publicized matter and gives the audience a look into the private lives of Muslim women. With me in the studio are two of the founding members of HM. One of them refers to himself as a bald white dude who's not a Muslim. I'll let him explain that. And two of the actresses. But before I properly introduce my guests, uh, let's watch a skit from Hijabi Monologues as performed by Rafia Jones. As soon as my son came home from college, I began dreaming about him getting married. He was my first. And every mother knows what it's like. When your kids get to that age, you want to see them settle down, have your grandchildren. I told my son when he came home, I want to look for a nice girl for you. What do you think? He told me, it's a waste of time, Mom. I don't have a job. I don't even know what I'm doing with my life. He thought he didn't have anything to offer. My son? My brother came to visit for a few days with his new wife. And the night before they left, I took him and my younger children to visit an old friend who was suffering with cancer. The doctor said he didn't have much time left. I told my son, I left your dinner on the table. Eat something before you go out. By the next morning, he was not home. And I thought, oh, Lord, what am I going to tell my new sister-in-law? What is she going to think? Why did he have to do this today? My children all slept late that morning and missed their bus. My son was still not home, and I couldn't focus. I was yelling at them and told them, just get in the car. I don't know what came over me with them sleeping late and I had to drop them off at school. My brother and new sister-in-law were getting ready to leave. La ilaha illallah. I couldn't focus on the road. Somehow I dropped them off and came back home, still not focused. La ilaha illallah. Around 10 AM, I came home. And as I turned onto my street, there was a police car parked in front of my house. You know what was my first thought. My son, was he in trouble? Did he hurt someone? Why are they here? I jumped out of the car, and when I knocked on the door, my brother answered it. But before letting me in, he held me. Sister, whatever they tell you, whatever happens, pray to Rakat. You must accept it. You have to be patient. Sifo, let me inside. And when I walked in, there was my niece, my sister-in-law, and two police officers sitting in our living room. My husband was still at work. They asked me to have a seat, and I would not. Then the older officer asked, ma'am, are you Shahriar's mother? Yes. Yes, I'm his mother. Where is he? Did he hurt someone? They looked at each other. They were so kind, so soft-spoken. Ma'am, your son is in the hospital. He's in the hospital. They were waiting for one of the parents to come home before they could say anything. Is he all right? 
Then they looked at me with such soft eyes. Then the older officer said, no, ma'am, I'm sorry. And then he looked down. He didn't make it. He didn't make it. I prayed two rakats. Now, I don't remember that entire month that followed very well. It was the month the lychee tree branches hung low with fruit. My daughter said there were many, many guests, hundreds. Not a day went by that the house wasn't overflowing with people. Not a day went by that there wasn't a feast. There was that moment I heard her calling my name when she came in a few hours later after her father's friend had picked her up from school. Where's my mother? She thought something had happened to me. No one had the heart to tell her, yet hundreds of eyes watched her as she looked for me. And she found me sitting on the couch in the women's room, surrounded by women, sitting quietly. She came close and fell to her knees. Mom, it must have been a strange thing. She said, I smiled at her and said, today is such a good day. Mom, didn't you hear the good news? Mom, today is your brother's wedding day. I don't remember that entire month very well. By the end, the lychee fruit were all gone. Don't let any guests leave without eating. I've always told my children. That day I told them, God has laid out a feast for your brother's wedding. At some point, a young woman with short blonde hair walked in and asked to meet the mother of the house. She walked right past the men's room and came into the women's room her eyes filled with tears. She hugged me. I know what it's like, sweetheart. I know. I lost my son, too. We're like sisters, you know? I can't remember who came in. There were so many people, hundreds and hundreds of guests, so many, the men had to be sent to the mosque. And so much food. Much of it was sent to the mosque with the men. I heard there was no one who came to visit who did not eat. You know how a bird quickly scoops food off the ground? My son was like that. No sooner was he on the ground that those birds just plucked him up. And yet, no one has seen a wedding feast like his was. 